I will introduce uh, Ray Dorsey, who um, will be sharing some data that actually was part of a Google grant. Um, so basically, I guess it was two years ago, um, or maybe less than that, about a year ago, uh, they were awarded a grant to look at Parkinson and around telemedicine. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the invitation to speak with you uh, today. Uh, good morning. My name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at Johns Hopkins, uh, where I direct the Movement Disorder or Parkinson's Disease Division and direct uh, neurology telemedicine. And a year ago, uh, Google was very kind enough to give a grant to Dr. Kevin Biglin and uh, to me to uh, evaluate uh, how we can use telemedicine or technologies that Google is developing to transform care uh, for Parkinson's disease. And uh, we're here to discuss uh, how we think we can transform care. And then Dr. Biglin is going to discuss how we can transform uh, research uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so as many of you know, the burden of Parkinson's disease, like many chronic conditions, is growing. Uh, but access to care uh, in the United States and globally is very limited. Uh, Google is currently enabling patients uh, with Parkinson's disease to receive uh, care from a specialist in their home. In addition, uh, with Google's support, we think that people from around the world uh, with Parkinson's disease uh, can receive care. And right now, most of the world's population with Parkinson's disease care with, with Parkinson's disease receive no care. And uh, finally, there's a number of uh, different Google's technologies that can be leveraged uh, to improve uh, care for patients with Parkinson's disease. So first, the, the burden. And the burden of Parkinson's disease, both in the United States and around the world, is growing uh, substantially. So in 2005, we estimate that about 4 million people with Parkinson's disease in the world's most populous countries and just due to the aging populations by 2030, that'll more than double. And by 2030, more than half the people with uh, Parkinson's disease in the world's most populous nations will be Chinese. So this is a problem not just for, develop, for developed or industrialized nations, but even a greater challenge for uh, developing nations. Uh, the challenge is that uh, access to Parkinson's disease specialists is limited by geography. So this is a, a map of Maryland County, and there's about, I'm, I'm sorry, Maryland State, and there's 23 counties in Maryland. And if you happen to live in Baltimore City or Baltimore uh, County in yellow, there's many uh, Parkinson's disease specialists. But um, if you live in any of these, 20 of these uh, other counties, there are none. Uh, in upstate New York, where Dr. Bigland practices, this is about a 150 to 200 mile uh, diameter oval and in there there's not a single Parkinson's disease specialist but there's 30 nursing homes many of whom have individuals with Parkinson's disease so the question is is how can you reach out uh, to these individuals to provide care in the United States uh, this is data for courtesy of Dr. Allison Willis uh, less or, uh, less than 60 percent of Medicare beneficiaries actually see a neurologist so more than 40% of Medicare beneficiaries, so people who have health insurance in the United States who have uh, Parkinson's disease do not see a neurologist. And you can see that you know, the darker areas are areas where more than three quarters of patients with Parkinson's disease do not see a neurologist. And obviously it's a little more prominent in the West and rural areas, but even on the East Coast, you can see many areas of the nation where 25% of the population does not see a, uh, a neurologist for their care. If you look outside the United States, it's an even um, uh, even scarier story. In Bolivia, when they've gone door to door and identified people with Parkinson's disease, not a single one uh, has had seen a neurologist, or not a neurologist, never, never been seen a physician uh, for their condition, even though Parkinson's disease is an eminently treatable condition. In China, there are about 2 million people with Parkinson's disease right now. It's only about 50 Parkinson's disease specialists. So one specialist for every city of everyone with Parkinson's disease. Um, and 40% of all countries, anti-Parkinsonian drugs are generally not available, even though they've been developed for over half a century. And 83% of low-income countries, there are no available treatments for Parkinson's disease. So the greatest challenge for Parkinson's disease, and probably for many chronic conditions, is that worldwide, most individuals with Parkinson's disease have never been diagnosed and never been treated, despite the fact that medicines are uh, inexpensive, uh, readily available, safe, improve quality of life, and decrease mortality. Um, those individuals who see a neurologist fare better than those who don't. This is data from the U.S. and Medicare data. And it shows that uh, individuals who are treated by a neurologist are 14% less likely to have, have a hip fracture, 21% less likely to be placed in a skilled nursing home facility, 
and 22% less likely to die. So a huge unmet need here in the United States where resources are um, uh, rich. Um, if you look at individuals who see a Parkinson's disease specialist, you know, highly specialized neurologists, they're three times more likely to be satisfied with their care. So access to care makes a difference for uh, Parkinson's disease, and it makes a difference for a range of uh, other uh, chronic conditions where improved access to specialists leads to higher quality of patient care and improved outcomes and quality of life. This is true for Parkinson's disease, it's true for heart disease, this is true for diabetes, it's true for just about any uh, chronic condition. So now I'd like to uh, turn to how, what Google is doing to actually help uh, transform the way we deliver healthcare for Parkinson's disease. So again, through a research grant that Google provided to us, um, 20 patients with Parkinson's disease at the University of Rochester and at Johns Hopkins were randomized to receive care either with Dr. Biglin or I uh, in clinic, just like you would at, uh, at a traditional outpatient clinic, or to receive care with us in their home um, via telemedicine or web-based video conferencing. And we were looking at to see, is this feasible? Can you deliver care to people in their homes, medical care? Uh, can you do, uh, can, is the motor examination that we do for Parkinson's disease, can you do that just as well in the home as you can do uh, in clinic? Can you demonstrate that the clinical outcomes that you get in the home are at least as good as those that you can get in the clinic? Can you improve quality of life? Can you improve patient satisfaction? And can you demonstrate economic value of telemedicine? And the study is still ongoing, but we have some preliminary data to address a couple of these that we want to share with you. And this Google-funded study is the first randomized clinical trial to evaluate the use of web-based video conferencing to actually deliver medical care from a physician directly into somebody's home. And we think this is a potential to transform care not just for Parkinson's disease, but for Alzheimer's disease, but for cancer, for diabetes, for any wide range of conditions for pediatric uh, patients. So these are the individuals who have participated in the study. Again, 20 individuals, nine were randomized to receive telemedicine. 11 to receive in-person care, and not surprisingly, they're about age around 65, which is um, very common for Parkinson's disease. About a quarter were women, uh, overwhelmingly white and educated um, uh, patients in this study, and they had a mild to moderate uh, disease as measured by different characteristics of uh, Parkinson's disease. These patients come from as uh, far away as 130 miles away, and um, uh, we're saving them uh, two hours of time. Um, so here's the University of Rochester. Uh, up here is the University of Rochester, and you can see in the blue are all the telemedicine patients, and the red are the usual care patients. So they're tra tra traveling for, again, as far as 130 miles away uh, at baseline, and some of these patients are now able to receive the care in their home. Each individual who sees, uh, receives the care in their home is saving, on average, 100 miles of transportation per visit and two hours of time. Uh, here in Baltimore, again, you would think of, it's a, you know, a, coast, a city on the eastern, uh, eastern seaboard, so you would think that access to care might not be as limited as much, but again, we're still seeing in blue telemedicine patients who are 120 miles, 100 miles away from us, and we're a relatively small state. So you can extrapolate, like, you know, here we are in California, you know, to take care of patients in Riverside County or in the Central Valley, you know, they don't have access to neurologists and that you can really uh, change the way that they're receiving the care. Um, so we've uh, completed uh, 20 in-person visits and 15 telemedicine visits. 13 of the telemedicine visits were completed as scheduled. We expect that we'll uh, be able to complete 90% of the telemedicine visits as, uh, as scheduled. And we've been able to complete the uh, motor assessments, uh, assessments of Parkinson's disease uh, remotely as we have been in person. And what really uh, strikes is that how efficient this model is. And we all know that healthcare is inefficient, and we're actually taking inefficiencies out of the system. So right now, uh, if a typical Parkinson's disease patient, when they come to Dr. Biglin or, or, or me, they'll spend you know, 170 minutes, two and a half hours uh, per visit to spend 14% of that time with the physician. So a lot of waste. When they see us in telemedicine, uh, they're devoting 38 minutes from computer on to computer off, and 76% of that time is spent with the physician, and only 24% is wasted. Uh, so we're trying to uh, turn the way we deliver healthcare on its head and really you know, change uh, the valuable part and make that the majority of the time that people are spending. Um, 
in our study, patients were very comfortable with that technology and preferred telemedicine. So it's a question, you know, we're dealing with older individuals, you know, is grandma uh, able to use a computer? And so the patients that we were taking care of are, were uh, very tech savvy, 100% using the internet daily, 80% using YouTube, 40% using Skype. Uh, all had uh, owned a, a computer, uh, many owned an iPad. Um, they were thirsting uh, for this model of care. I think I've never had a study for which recruitment was easier. Uh, I think I've recruited all of my patients in two clinic days. 90% uh, would prefer to receive uh, care via telemedicine rather than their usual, uh, than usual care. And 45% expressed uh, at the outset of the study without before even enrolling a willingness to pay more than their uh, typical copay to receive this model of care. And so our, our sample, you know, how representative is our sample of the general population? But among in, uh, adults 50 to 64, you know, three quarters use the internet daily, 50% are using uh, uh, video sharing sites like YouTube. The fastest growing segment of uh, social networking are the uh, are older adults. Uh, so, you know, this is only going to increase uh, over time and people's comfort level with the technology will increase. And so we've now discussed how we're doing in the United States, and these technologies, they don't respect uh, uh, borders. They're not worried about licensure rules. And so that at uh, Hopkins, we've been able to now provide care to patients in nine different countries on three different continents. And so that many of these are individuals who came to Baltimore for their initial assessment, and now we can say, rather than never see you again, or we wish you the best in the future, or come see us, in a year or two, we can provide care to you in your home uh, on an ongoing basis. So we've seen uh, patients in a wide range of uh, locations, you know, everywhere from Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil to uh, Kuwait, and uh, the patients um, have appreciated it. This is a, a low-tech version of what a, a telemedicine visit uh, looks like. In February, and uh, how have you been doing? Oh, a little better than I thought I would be. Good. What's better? Uh, mindset, physical. You know, I'm I'm up to sixty. I'm up to sixty minutes a week on the exercise, so that's good. Sixty minutes a week? <laughs> I told you, I'm not much on exercise. I'm doing the best I can. Huh? Good. And then with your right hand, can you open and close your right hand? Just your thumb and index finger on your right hand? So he's in Mexico he City. I'm in Baltimore. Yeah, I'd like to see it. I don't know why. And he's an American uh, living in Mexico. Keep going. And then open and close. All the way open. So you can see some slowness in his hand. And twist. Left hand. Can get Good. Can you stand up? Can you put your arms like this and stand up? Ideally, you'd like to have a little more space behind him that you can walk and assess his walking, but you still get a since you also get additional sense of his social history. So, uh, it scares me that I, I feel better than I did before. Why does it scare you? Because that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> You're supposed, as I understand the way this works, is that you get worse and worse and worse. Well, the disease progresses over time, but we try to make you function at the highest level as possible. Well, uh, I'm doing better than I did before. Um, so we're able to, you know, extend the care that he was receiving for me uh, in Baltimore when he came for an initial evaluation and to continue to provide his care wherever he is. Um, this is a model, so lots of it, we're in, you know, in Silicon Valley, so there's lots of uh, companies looking at telemedicine as an application, and we think there's a couple of ways that this model that Google's helping support uh, differentiates itself from the services that are being currently provided by startup companies. Uh, these are all different startup companies in telemedicine, and most of them are focused on acute one-time consultations, 
We think this model that we're developing with you is a, a fantastic way to carry for individuals with chronic diseases. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease have the disease on, on average for about 14 years of, uh, of life. And over time, the disease does progress and their ability to access care uh, decreases. So in many senses that the people who need the care the most can get it the least. And we think that this is a, a nice way to look at uh, looking at chronic disease management and obviously has a novel uh, focus in terms of disease interest. News. I'm Renee Montaigne. And I'm Steve Inskeep. Good morning. If you don't live in a major city, it can be hard to find medical specialists, and that is especially true for people with chronic disorders like Parkinson's disease who need frequent care. And today in Your Health, we look at patients who are turning to specialists hundreds of miles away to get the attention they need by video. Doctors and patients like the video appointments, but insurance companies are not yet convinced. NPR's Nancy Shute reports. Deanna Ventura was seeing a neurologist for her but she was still having trouble walking, bathing, and doing her housework. I knew that I needed more than what he was doing for me. So Managing Parkinson's symptoms is a tricky business, and the drugs used can have serious side effects. You need a specialist. But for Ventura, the closest was two hours away from her home in upstate New York. And she doesn't drive. So the specialist comes to her. So I last saw you in February, and uh, how have you been doing since February? If it sounds like Ray Dorsey is far away, that's because he is, 343 miles away at Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore. He's a movement disorder specialist, and he's been Ventura's doctor for the last four years. So this is a sense that there's different ways of getting some media attention. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are interested in this way to improve access to care for people with relatively rare conditions where access is even more limited. I wanted to devote the last few minutes before turning over uh, to Dr. Biglin uh, about the, a, a new model for delivering uh, care uh, to, to expand this model uh, for individuals around the world. So our thought is that with Google's help that we can create a free telemedicine clinic so that individuals anywhere in the world with Parkinson's disease uh, can get access to the care that they need. A one-time consultation with a specialist who's trained in Parkinson's disease and be able to provide care to many people who currently are unable to access care and at least uh, provide initial direction and guidance uh, to these individuals. Uh, we think that this technology can be done obviously on computers and laptops, but you, you know, using the Android platform and the video conferencing software that we're using, you could readily do this on a, a tablet computer or on uh, Android enabled uh, cell phones. And the way this would look is that this uh, clinic would, uh, patients could sign up securely online uh, to uh, uh, indicate their interest in receiving care, select a uh, select number of patients to, to receive their care on a monthly basis. We can readily assist uh, patients in uh, setting up the technology. We do that right now. It takes about 15 minutes of a research assistance time for patients to uh, receive their care. I mean, to, to get familiar with the technology, they could receive their care from a Parkinson's disease specialist and those recommendations could be sent uh, to the patients and to their uh, physicians. And we think that we obviously can do this with the University of Rochester and Johns Hopkins, but we can probably do this with institutions throughout the country and around the world. And then a number of Google's technologies can be leveraged to improve care for, uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease. And so we uh, alluded to, you know, Android uh, uh, software platform for uh, mobile devices uh, can obviously, you know, help with uh, fall detection and decrease falls. This is important not just for people with Parkinson's disease, but for uh, uh, patients, elderly uh, populations that are increasing in their uh, prevalence, both in the United States and around the world. Uh, you know, Google Plus would be a great uh, forum for creating a social network for patients with Parkinson's disease or other uh, chronic conditions to share uh, information uh, with uh, other individuals and other caregivers who are carrying the same burden. Uh, YouTube could be used for, as an educational platform, both for patients, for caregivers, for uh, training providers, especially in developing nations where most individuals receiving care won't be receiving care from a neurologist, but from, you know, healthcare aides or, or uh, nurses or social workers or people that are in the field. Um, we think that this model is, could uh, take a spin on Google Docs, so rather than just, you know, using Thinking about it as uh, documents, you can now think about it as, as physicians. So uh, Google Docs uh, could be providing care to people uh, around the world, and the platform and the technology itself can help facilitate communications, as could the calendar and uh, Gmail. 
Um, you know, Google Trends has been uh, recently described to show how it can track uh, outbreaks of infectious diseases. And this uh, uh, same technology could be used to help us understand what are the needs of physicians. And, you know, text messaging could, you know, be used, for example, to help improve uh, adherence to medications. Uh, so with Google, we think there's, this model can be expanded uh, by geography, by condition, you know, Parkinson's disease, perhaps Alzheimer's disease, next and beyond neurology. We can go into, in, into patients' homes, which we've done. We've gone into nursing homes, retirement communities, and then Dr. Biglin's going to talk about clinical trials. So finally, in conclusion, you know, Google can really help shift the paradigm of, of healthcare. You know, uh, the changes that need to occur in healthcare are unlikely to come from the healthcare industry itself. It's going to be likely to come from those outside the industry. We have failed uh, for a generation to, to do it. It's technology firms and it's uh, entrepreneurship that needs to come in to change the way that we deliver health care. We think that your technolo technological capabilities, the expertise that um, uh, University of Rochester has in telemedicine and Johns Hopkins international reach can enable that uh, patients uh, anywhere, anywhere with Parkinson's disease can get the care that they need. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Biglin. I'm Dr. Kevin Biglin. I'm a neurologist and movement disorder specialist at the University of Rochester, uh, and I'm the associate chair for clinical research in the Department of Neurology. And I want to take this opportunity to talk to you about uh, how uh, web-based uh, video conferencing and uh, other technology can be utilized to uh, maximize um, uh, cl uh, clinical research, uh, specifically experimental research uh, through clinical trials. So utilizing the same type of technology that Dr. Dorsey just spoke about with regards to uh, providing care for Parkinson's disease patients, we see this as a uh, powerful uh, tool for uh, evaluating uh, patients in uh, clinical research studies. And hopefully this will lead uh, to uh, increasing um, a pace of, uh, of therapeutic research in a variety of diseases. Uh, our specific interest is in neurologic and neurodegenerative diseases. And I want to speak to you uh, t today largely about, one, the burdens associated with tr clinical trial participation and the barriers to enrollment, how remote technologies can facilitate that, um, and then what are our next steps. So uh, this uh, is the tallest mountain in New York State. <laughs> I'm supposed to stay at the podium. I tend to wander. This is the, uh, uh, and it's uh, about a mile high. So. The, the summit of this mountain is uh, the same height as Denver. <laughs> um, it's called Mount Marcy, and uh, I uh, was foolish enough at one point to decide that I was going to climb there, actually ski up this mountain in the middle of winter, and then I was going to ski down it, which I ultimately did. And you're kind of uh, chugging along here for multiple hours trying to figure out, you know, chugging, 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 and you think, you know, at some point, when am I ever going to see the summit of this mountain? You know, it's been hours now, and I'm a little bit tired. And so you, uh, you come around this turn here, and you kind of get this glorious view of the summit of Mount Marcy. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's great. I'm so close now. And then you realize, actually, uh, it's not really that close. I still have a uh, really significant way to go before I'm at the top. And I think, actually, that's kind of where we stand with uh, clinical trials, therapeutic research in, in a variety of neurologic diseases. We've, uh, we've kind of uh, set the stage here where we can kind of see the summit to improve therapies for a variety of neurologic diseases. But the reality is uh, that that last little bit is still a challenge uh, to get to. Uh, and there are a number of burdens and barriers associated with that, many of which uh, telemedicine and web-based technologies can uh, facilitate. So drug development, as we all know, is, ex is increasingly expensive. Um, you know, most of that, uh, the cost for drug development uh, is in the uh, clinical trial period, so the period where we're actually testing therapies in patients. Um, and that is, uh, those costs have increased uh, dramatically over the last uh, 30 years. The major driver of cost really is our ability to recruit uh, individuals into studies. Um, more than 80% of studies, there's a delay in recruitment. Um, nearly a quarter of the time spent in the, the, the completion of the trial is just spent in getting the people into the study. Um, most, many studies, a third of them, don't even meet their target enrollment, and this has really profound implications for uh, uh, the interpretation of the studies. Um, 
It uh, slow recruitment adds up to about $16 billion in direct costs. That's not really even accounting for the fact that uh, we have a number of trials that are ultimately uh, fail. Um, and a third of trials need to seek additional funding, largely because their slow recruitment uh, has uh, impacted them. And I'll give you an example of that eventually. But ultimately, um, this leads to failed trials or underpowered trials, even more uh, so, where um, the, we don't enroll enough people into the study to really get uh, the answers that we need. Uh, and unfortunately, people don't like to participate in trials. Uh, even in diseases, you know, fatal diseases like uh, cancer, um, only about 3 to 5 percent of people who are eligible for clinical trials participate in trials. In Parkinson's disease, it's even worse. Only about 1 percent of people who participate in trials, um, who, who are eligible to participate in trials, participate. And we're never going to find treatments for these diseases unless people are willing to participate. Um, Huntington's disease, which is a disorder, uh, a neurologic disorder, uh, inherited disease that results in progressive declines in motor function, cognitive function, impairments in behavior, and ultimately leading to death, um, is, uh, is a small disease, but a disease of, of, of great interest to the neurologic community in terms of identifying therapies that either can slow the progression or prevent the onset of disease, even more importantly. Uh, and so uh, the Huntington Study Group, which is an academic consortium, looked uh, uh, at particular uh, individuals uh, who were either related to Huntington's, either had Huntington's disease, uh, had the gene for Huntington's disease, had a spouse with Huntington's disease, um, et cetera, and uh, surveyed them about what were the barriers to, barriers to participation. And um, one of the most important barriers was missing work. This becomes increasingly prevalent when we're talking about diseases where we can identify people who are at risk for disease but are not yet sick. So these are people who are otherwise healthy, living their lives. They know that they may or are going to develop a disease in the near future. There are a number of Parkinsonian disorders that, that fall into this category. But Huntington's disease is kind of the prototypical one. And these are individuals who are young, working full-time, have families, and the uh, ability to participate in trials uh, due to uh, time barriers uh, related to work, travel barriers, uh, are increasingly important. So uh, the major barriers that people identified were time, travel, lost work. We recently completed a study uh, in the population of people who uh, carried the gene for Huntington's disease but were not yet sick, and this was the prequel study. It was a phase two study looking at a nutritional supplement coenzyme Q10. It's the first multicenter study uh, in individuals at 100% risk for developing a disease, for developing Huntington's disease prior to them being sick. Uh, we only, our goal was only to enroll 90 individuals, and initially we had 10 sites in order you know, uh, to do that. And we looked at three doses of coenzyme Q10. There was no placebo arm in this study. Short study, 20, 20 weeks, but seven visits over the course of the study. We were mainly looking at um, the uh, tolerability of the, the treatment in a population who's otherwise healthy, as well as looking at some biomarker data um, and the feasibility of conducting a study in this population. And this is what our enrollment curve looked like. Uh, and you can see our projected enrollment is the green dashed line here. Um, and we had anticipated that really we would be able to enroll everyone within nine months of the study. All the data that we had going into the study suggested that was going to be the case. People were very enthusiastic. This population was very enthusiastic about enrolling. Even more importantly, we thought we had a captive population. There is a large observational study called the PREDICT study, which is looking at people who carry the gene for Huntington's disease but are not yet ill, uh, and just following them over time. And all the people, all the sites that we involved in this study were involved in this trial. Involved in this trial, there was over 400 individuals uh, who were potentially eligible to enroll in the study at these different sites, and we were asking them to enroll about a quarter of those people who were already involved in research. Uh, and you can see, actually, uh, you know, just a few months in, they did pretty well. But just a few months in, uh, we really flattened out. Uh, and our sites were telling us, you know what, we've approached everyone that we know of to be involved in the study that we currently are seeing. Um, and uh, there's just nobody else left to enroll. And uh, so this was kind of problematic. And this is even more problematic, because this is a population that's actually not in the healthcare system in general. This population, people who may be gene carriers, are not necessarily seeking care. Many of them actually uh, would be just as happy to not think about the fact that they may be at risk or may be carrying the gene for the disease. And if you want to put that in their face every day for you know f by being involved in a trial, that's that's a potential issue. So we we kind of had to go back to the drawing board and you know say, well, what do we what did we do about this? And so well, we said, well. 
we have a lot of visits over 20 weeks. Maybe we eliminate some of the visits. That'll make it more palatable for people. We added additional sites. That was ultimately probably very beneficial for us, uh, more sites. But uh, it resulted in the fact that we actually, this whole delay uh, resulted in the fact that our drug expired. <laughs> we had to order a new drug. We had to add a manufactured new drug. Um, and that obviously has huge impacts on costs. Um, but it ultimately was successful, but it took two years to enroll this population. We had anticipated nine months. It took more than twice as long uh, to do this. You can kind of see this is where we flattened out here, and then we started to make changes, in the, and the enrollment again did pick up. Uh, but you know, this is kind of a real-life example of where you know, uh, recruiting for trials is never uh, what you think it's going to be, and there are always uh, uh, challenges. And so we actually wanted to know specifically from this population of uh, individuals who are eligible for participation why they didn't participate. And you can see these, these themes kind of are recurrent. Time missed from work, time-intensive study, just not interested. Travel. 40% of people thought that travel was a major barrier to their participation in this specific study. Okay. So these themes are going to continue uh, to come up. I want to touch, uh, you know, base a little bit about when we're talking about neurologic diseases and specifically neurodegenerative diseases. You know, what is the ultimate goal in these diseases with regards to therapeutic research? And probably the primary thing, if we, had, you know, if we had to pick one thing that we could do that would be ideal, we'd be able to identify people before they were sick, intervene in some way, and prevent them from getting ill. And this is kind of the preventive trial, trial paradigm that we think about. And we think about it most specifically in Huntington's disease because we can identify that population with 100% certainty through genetic testing. But if you have a group of people, you intervene at some point here, um, and you have this is uh, the uh, treated group at the t in, in the triangles at the top, and the squares are the placebo group. You can see that if you can intervene, then you can push back this period where there is a diagnosis of disease back relative to the, the untreated population. And this is our goal for a variety of neurologic diseases. Certainly, this is our goal in Alzheimer's disease. We think we're increasingly able to identify people prior to a diagnosis or onset of symptoms or even onset of brain changes or uh, biomarker changes uh, in Alzheimer's disease. We're getting close to this in Parkinson's disease. We can identify people at high risk for developing Parkinson's disease prior to onset. And so this is a paradigm that becomes increasingly important as we move forward, particularly as genetics allows us to identify people at increasingly high risk for disease prior to onset. Unfortunately, this has a couple of problems. One is, as I alluded to, this idea of identifying people at risk. Uh, Huntington's disease is nice because we can do that pretty easily. Uh, in general, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, even common ones, are uh, relatively uncommon in the population. Uh, and you don't want to include everybody in a study uh, for people who are low, at a low likelihood of getting sick. Uh, and these diseases are slowly progressive. I think uh, Dr. Dorsey's patient said, you know, we're all supposed to get worse. <laughs> and uh, that is true. These are degenerative diseases. People get worse over time, but they tend to get worse very slowly. And in Parkinson's disease, where we have effective interventions, People actually feel that they do better, uh, at least in the short term, um, as that gentleman so uh, eloquently said. Uh, so these long time horizons, slow progression um, of disease. And then ultimately, how do we define disease onset? The bottom line for this, really, in, in, in the context of this discussion, is that all of these uh, barriers suggest that we need to have large amounts of patients followed for long periods of time. Even if we can identify somebody who's at 100% risk, like Huntington's disease, for disease, uh, Huntington's disease, um, we still don't know when they're going to develop the disease. We can make some estimates or probability estimates about when that's going to happen, but the reality is we don't necessarily uh, know for sure when that's going to happen, and we, it could be 10 years from now, and are we going to be following these people for 10 years? Well, I think some people would argue that we might have to. And I want to put this again in some real numbers for you just to give you an idea. There are about uh, 30,000 people in the United States uh, uh, who have Huntington's disease. Um, there are about 150,000 people who are at, at risk for having Huntington's disease. That means um, uh, most of them won't have Huntington's disease. About 90,000 of them will be unaffected. Uh, the, uh, the other 60,000 will be uh, gene carriers um, for the condition. So out of a population of uh, gene carriers in North America is about 60,000 individuals. If you start looking at you know, age, the people who are most likely to develop a diagnosis of Huntington's disease during a, uh, that time period, you really start to get your numbers down to about 20,000 people who are really eligible for participation in a trial of this kind. 
And if you take your standard trial where you're randomizing people to placebo, um, you're assuming a, a small rate of, of about 4% per year, which in the population we look at is probably pretty accurate. Low dropout rates, 5% dropout rate per year. That's, that's uh, um, probably uh, optimistic. Uh, and your standard power and, and alpha standards. This is the, um, these are the types of sample sizes that we're looking at. So if you, uh, if you look at the, you know, this top left um, corner here, if you have a small therapeutic effect, that means that there's a 10% reduction in the rate of diagnosis in people who are treated versus people in the placebo group, and you follow them for three years. So that's a relatively small effect, but probably meaningful effect, honestly. Um, you would need about 20,000 people. We know that there are 20,000 people who would be eligible for this study, so that probably seems unrealistic. Uh, we know in, from Parkinson's disease and cancer studies that if we can get 5% of people to participate in trials, we're doing a good job. In, um, yeah, in Huntington's disease, they expect 100% uh, involvement is uh, obviously unrealistic. So the real goals there are we either you know, look for a very large treatment effect or we follow people for a long period of time. I think it's unrealistic to think anticipate a large treatment effect. Um, we want to look for the... Uh, smallest effect that is going to be clinically meaningful for individuals, patients, et cetera. Um, and so we're really getting to a point where if 10% is meaningful, we need to follow large groups of people for long periods of time. And ultimately, uh, you know, this is a problem because uh, it may be not be realistic. We know that the longer you follow people in a, in a clinical trial, the less likely they are to continue to participate in that trial, and that the you know, the uh, dropout rates become almost logarithmic. You know, when you start to follow people for greater than five years. Um, but technology may be a means for allowing us to evaluate people uh, potentially in their homes, ideally in their homes, uh, of, uh, for long periods of time. And this certainly could be invaluable in our uh, development of therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. And we think it is valuable. We think it has impacts on costs. We think uh, primarily through its ability to facilitate recruitment. We reduce travel bur burden uh, for pa both patients and caregivers. Um, uh, we can increase the geographic scope. So this international uh, collaboration is a, a valuable one for uh, for us, in, both in terms of providing care to individuals, but also uh, opening up access to uh, clinical trial, clinical research opportunities for individuals with neurodegenerative disease. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's interesting to, to note that, you know, we've been doing this all along, that in diseases, relatively rare diseases, or diseases where we know we can't uh, get the population uh, at one location, we start to expand the population. And certainly in Huntington's disease, the research community uh, and even the care community has become an international community. And so this already exists, uh, but if we can facilitate that, uh, uh, even better. And then ultimately, there may be uh, issues with improved data collection, improved data. And I think a lot of what we want to talk about ultimately uh, after this is how can, what kind of data can we capture uh, using technology, um, can we somehow uh, improve uh, the way that we do our assessments so that people are interested in performing the assessments, uh, making assessments fun, <laughs> uh, so that people are more willing to, to do it and you have uh, more data and better data. Um, we often ask people to keep, I hate to say this at Google, written logs of of what the, how they're doing and, you know, in terms of uh, you know, how they're functioning. Uh, we'll talk about an instance of blood pressure monitoring where we ask people to keep written logs. Um, but that is obviously wrought with error because people, number one, tend not to do it. Uh, and if they do do it, they do it uh, at the last minute before they see the doctor. And then we know that data is probably not very good. And this is the, uh, the model that we envision uh, in terms of utilizing remote home-based assessments and how they can be beneficial for uh, in clinical trials. So you have remote assessments in the home there we go. Uh, which ultimately results in decreased burden of participants. They don't have to come to the site. They don't have to travel 150 miles to be evaluated by the specialist in the field to, to be involved in the study. They can be evaluated in their home. They don't have to take off work necessarily. Um, the investigator potentially could do the evaluation in their home as well. So you could imagine that you could be doing it at times that is both convenient for the investigator and for the patient. We talked about this issue of broad geographical reach. Um, expanding geographical reach increases the number of participants involved in the study. Ultimately, both of these things facilitate recruitment, shorter duration of recruitment, uh, and less cost, ultimately. 
uh, again, if we can uh, reduce the burden, we can increase, increase the likelihood that somebody will continue in a study for a long period of time, uh, which would ultimately result in, you know, we often have to account for about 20% dropout in studies. If we can re account for a smaller dropout rate, we can have smaller sample size, less costs. Um, and I think uh, an important issue with the, not only the geographic scope, but it's increasing access to people who couldn't otherwise participate in trials. And Parkinson's disease is, is an excellent example here where we have, we do have large unmet therapeutic needs in Parkinson's disease, particularly around areas of psychosis and dementia in that population. Um, however, most of those individuals who are suffering from psychosis and dementia are not residing in the community. Many of them are residing in nursing homes. People in nursing homes in general do not participate in clinical research at all. So we have a population who has unmet therapeutic needs who does not participate in, in, in research. And so what do we, how do we, how will we address that? Well, we, we take people with less severe problems related to that who are living in the community to enroll. And that's probably not the population we're most interested in. We're actually interested in the population that is in a nursing home because they have psychosis. Um, and so expanding the uh, not only geographic scope, but increasing the access to care for individuals even residing in our own communities who otherwise don't participate in research. And we do, you know, we do have uh, evidence that people are interested in this idea. And so again, this is the project aware, and the yellow bar there is this idea of home web-based assessments. And overall, people who uh, thought, you know, thought that home web-based assessments would be the the best way or the way that would most favorably influence their ability or their willingness to participate in a clinical trial. So uh, you give them a variety of different options about what, you know, what things would be beneficial for you or what things would facilitate your involvement in a study. And the thing that comes back to is that if you come to my home or in some way, uh, you know, virtually or otherwise, uh, we'd be much more willing to participate. And that's in Huntington's disease. But this holds true in Alzheimer's disease, which is obviously, is a, for many people, a much more pressing need uh, in terms of experimental therapies. And in this survey, they asked individuals, you know, what was your, what would be your willingness to participate in cl clinical trials if we did the assessments in the home, if we... Uh, if the likelihood of getting placebo was less. And again, the thing that comes back is that if you can do assessments in my home, that is the one driving force that is most likely to um, allow me to do that. But, um, you know, we talk about doing these, these assessments, but they're also, you know, in, and when we think about that, we're often thinking about assessments to show that a treatment is potentially efficacious. Um, but when we're doing a study and we don't know a lot about the uh, potential harms of a treatment, it's just as important that we can identify potential harm early and as quickly as possible. And so we recently completed a phase a two study of azratapine. This is a uh, available medication. It's a calcium channel blocker medication used to treat blood hypertension, uh, high blood pressure. Um, and uh, for that ma matter, it, it tends to drop blood pressure, which is what it's supposed to do. But in Parkinson's disease, that's a potential problem. Uh, individuals with Parkinson's disease in general have low blood pressure to begin with. They have uh, dis uh, in a dysfunction in their ability to regulate their blood pressure, so they have a tendency to drop their blood pressure as they stand up. Uh, we know that low blood pressure is a risk factor for falling in Parkinson's disease. So all of these things kind of came to a head with, we want to look at this treatment, but we know that we it's going to have an impact on blood pressure, and we need to... Uh, we need to monitor that closely. And so as I talked about, or alluded to earlier, we, uh, you know, we actually asked people to keep a written diary uh, of that. Now, they collected their blood pressure. The blood pressure was stored on their blood pressure cuff. That was, data was ultimately uploaded uh, intermittently. Um, but physicians had to make decisions about um, medication dosages based on the blood pressure logs, and it wasn't as easy to access the blood pressure cuff. So we asked them to keep a written log. So this is a huge burden. Not only were we asking them to take their blood pressure twice a day, we're asking them to record it in a, in a log. Um, and the thing is, what if their blood pressure was 40 over 20? You, nobody knew about that until two weeks later when they came into the doctor's office, unless they were really having a lot of symptoms associated with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, we thought uh, in discussions with uh, um, Sapir Consulting and, and Marvell that there might be a better way of trying to uh, do this, of capturing uh, blood pressure data in an ongoing trial in that we could get information in real time. Uh, and individuals would not be have the burden of having to capture that data on their own. So we used this kind of, uh, in retrospect, uh, cumbersome device <laughs> where we had a uh, plug computer, plugs into the wall, um, the blood pressure cuff here plugs into the, plug, the computer, the computer plugs into the router, um, and this gets uploaded. At the time, it was a Google Health database, and then we were able to pull that data off. Um, and we, we did get data. Um, 
And so we were like, well, this actually is a potentially valuable means for capturing this type of blood pressure data uh, and allows us to see it in real time. And you can envision that you could have parameters set on this so that if there was uh, an issue with the blood pressure, somebody, uh, a medical monitor of some sort, could get uh, notified of this in real time, that there was a uh, abnormal blood pressure, and then some sort of intervention could be done at the time and not two weeks later when the person comes in. Um, so we were kind of excited about that. Unfortunately, um, two-thirds of the patients actually couldn't do this. <laughs> uh, and largely, it was around issues, logistical issues. They thought they had done it. They thought they had uploaded the data, but we had no data on them whatsoever. Um, and so ultimately, remote technologies that do this type of monitoring, they need to be easy and intuitive. Um, they need to be low burden. I would, I would venture they need to be automatic. Somebody needs to take their blood pressure, and that data needs to be available to the clinician or the medical monitor immediately. Uh, and maybe they need to be fun. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> uh, but this is um, an important uh, issue in terms of remote monitoring uh, in clinical research settings. So ultimately, uh, you know, in terms of future directions, I think this is, a, this is just a smattering of what we can talk about. But there really, uh, there's a really, a, this is a wide open uh, area that hasn't been uh, broached by the clinical trials or clinical research community too much. So certainly there are technological issues that we can uh, do uh, that we need to move into. Increasing broadband access or increasing uh, access to cellular networks would be one means of facilitating uh, uh, remote technology in trials. Um, we, need, we need technologies that are both intuitive and uh, automatic for individuals. Uh, mobile technologies, both for care but also for assessing a variety of uh, outcomes in clinical trials. Uh, and then we talked about uh, the gaming of technologies to make uh, the assessments fun so that we are getting as much data as possible. Missing data is the bane of our existence, and if we can maximize uh, uh, missing data, minimize missing data, that would be ideal. Scientifically, you know, the, the scientific community is still out on this issue, whether or not this is feasible, um, and we need to demonstrate the feasibility of doing this. We've demonstrated the feasibility of doing this in clinical care settings, I think, quite nicely. Uh, as Dr. Dorsey talked about, but we still need to show that this can be done in a clinical trial setting and that the data that we capture is as good as the data that we're currently capturing in person. Um, and then ultimately, if we can show that uh, treatments, uh, in experimental therapies, have an impact on our remote data collection, that speaks to the uh, value of this as well, as well as the validity of collecting data remotely. Uh, ultimately, we need to be able to show that data collected remotely can uh, show a clinically meaningful benefit with an intervention. Um, and then one other thing that's interesting is that remote technologies not only can be uh, a wee means of assessing how people are doing, a means of assessing safety outcomes, but also could be a, a mechanism for um, intervening in patients. And we talked about exercise programs. We know exercise is important in Parkinson's disease. Are there technologies that we can utilize to, uh, to facilitate exercise programs, exercise interventions in Parkinson's disease? Can we... Um, uh, can we utilize that data to evaluate what aspects of the intervention are most effective? And then ultimately, we need external buy-in from not only the scientific community, but funding sources uh, and regulatory uh, sources. The big uh, issue in terms of clinical trials is going to be this issue around um, whether or not the data that we collect remotely uh, is going to be considered uh, good enough for ultimately for FDA approval of new therapies in neurologic diseases. And that's all I have. Thank you. All four minutes of it until we get kicked out. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to uh, record them as, as we go through. Uh, I have a question about the tool you use for, for the telepresence. Yeah. Um, I noticed you were talking about the Hangouts as, a, as like a, a collaborative you know, group therapy kind of thing. Um, but I'm wondering if the tool that you were using in the, in the video, it, how it differs. Is it something like, like keeping track of time or billing or, or scheduled calls or is there a particular thing? So the video conferencing software? Yeah, so the video conferencing software we use is uh, from a company where we use two, one from Polycom and then more recently from a company called Video. <laughs> V-I-D-Y-O, and it's HIPAA compliant and secure. It's more user-friendly, I think, than we've experienced with the Polycom. It takes a, a patient about 10 to 15 minutes working with a, a college undergrad uh, to install a program on their uh, computer. Same software can be used on mobile devices, can be used on iPads. 
so it's a very easy to pretty easy to use for individuals and relatively inexpensive. But you know, we you know, uh, Dr. Dorsey can talk about this more. But we you know we have experience in this group visit model for Parkinson's disease, and you can see where these types of applications might be utilized in that. If, if that's what you're one of the things you're getting at. My question was was really sort of is there like a a, a, um, a quantitative thing like like keeping track of billing of, of time for billing or or scheduled calls or anything like that or is it just you know there's, it's really there's just web based video conferencing there's no no bells one. or whistles so uh, our you know the billing is a is a big barrier to providing care uh, via telemedicine and you know we can talk about that ad nauseum but. Uh, um, Right now, you're largely not reimbursed for telemedicine care, um, and so we've um, been utilizing grants, contracts, et cetera, to, to fund the, the effort so far. So we don't have to, which is, in many respects, nice. We don't have to worry about all the billing issues so much. Um, you know what I mean? But you could see how that could uh, facilitate billing compliance. There is a means uh, often used in Parkinson's disease, uh, time-based, uh, billing, um, which is probably relevant in Parkinson's disease, and this would be a, a means of tracking that, certainly. Any other questions? <clears throat> we are going to spend some time with the doctors after, so you're more than welcome to join us. We're going to sort of talk about the futures, but um, thank you for attending, and thank you, doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.